Ksubas Daf Chov Dalid Mishnah. Two men testify about themselves that they are Kohanim. They are not believed. Although generally the lawyer is Eidach Odnam and Risur, and one witness is believed in non-marital prohibitions, this testimony has monetary implications. The privilege to collect true men consume Karbanos. However, the marital restrictions of a coin apply to them because of Shavya Nafshei Chaticha Disura. However, if they not only testify about themselves, but include testimony about each other being Kohanim, they are believed. One witness suffices to establish another as a Kohen. Rabbi Lezer agrees with this unless he is challenged by another witness who denies he is a Kohen. Additionally, he disagrees with the Tanakama that if they testify on behalf of each other, the court suspects collusion. Rabbi Shimon Gamliel also holds that one witness can establish one as a Kohen. Rabbi Yehuda holds one witness does not suffice to establish one as a Kohen. The Mishnahs in this chapter brought four cases of Pesha Asr Peshahitir. Question, why so many cases to illustrate the same point? The answer, the first case this field was your father's without the second part I purchased it forfeits the property. Second case, witnesses testified these are our signatures, but we were coerced, does not involve forfeiting anything. Therefore, their initial intention may have been to confirm their signatures, but subsequently change their minds or intended their qualifications from the outset. On the other hand, the purchaser who may have added his, his last statement, not to lose, does not qualify as a Pesha Osir Pesha Hitir. Had the Mishnah mention only these cases, the principal Pesha Osir Pesha Hitir would apply only to money matters, but not to prohibitions, such as the third case where a woman testified she was married but now divorced. The fourth case, a woman claimed she was taken captive but wasn't defiled, was to teach that if witnesses testified to her captivity after she remarried, based on a Pesha Osir Pesha Hitir, she can remain married, or if they both testified about their companions, it teaches that the court does not suspect her and her companion of Gomlin. The last case are Mishnah, two men testifying there, they are Kohanim, is to relate the dispute between Rabbi Huda and the Rabbonim. <clears throat> A price is similar to our Mishnah teaches that if two testify about themselves and each other that they are Kohanim, they both can eat Trumba, but they each require two out of three witnesses to permit them to marry a woman of untainted lineage, whereas Rabbi Yehuda holds three are required even to eat truma. The Gemara assumes the Rabbanan do not suspect collusion, whereas Rabbi Yehuda does suspect collusion. Question. A donkey driver testifies that the grain he is transporting is still moist and untithed, but the grain of his competition is tithed. He is not believed because the Tanakhama suspects him of collusion, whereas Rabbi Yehuda holds he is believed, both adopting positions contrary to our Mishnah. The answer. The first solution is Ravada, who holds to reverse their opinion. Abai answers that Rabbi Yehuda does not suspect collusion for Demai. Although donkey drivers are Ame Aretz, who do not tithe, their testimony about their competitor's grain being tithed is believed. Rov Ame Aretz Masrinheim. Also, according to the Rabbonin, these Mishnahs do not contradict. They suspect collusion because the one denigrating his merchandise is traveling with the selling utensil. Why discourage buyers unless it involves collusion? The next answer disregards the element of collusion. Rabbi Yudha holds one who receives truma from granaries, testifies to his genealogy. Therefore, two must witness this. The Rabbanan hold it does not testify to his genealogy. Therefore, one witness suffices to allow him to eat truma. Question. Is one referred to as a Kohen in documents genealogically fit? The answer, if the document states that I, a Kohen, borrowed money from Ploni, Rav Huna of Chizda dispute whether the witnesses who signed testify only about the loan or even about the identity of the borrower. If so, they investigated his status before start, signing. Question, does the Sias Kapayim elevate a Kohen and genealogically fit? According to the opinion that a Kohen who receives truma is genealogically fit, it could be because a non-Kohen who eats truma is liable to Misavide Shemayim, whereas a non-Kohen who blessed Birchus Kohanim violates only an Iser essay. Alternatively, Birchus Kohanim is performed publicly. A non-Kohen would not have the audacity to bless publicly, whereas eating truma could be done in private. Answer. This is also disputed by Rav Chizda and Rav Avina. 
Although Rav attempted to prove from, Rabbi, from Nehemiah's instructions to Kohanim, who came up from Bavil, whose status was questionable, could continue to eat truma and perform birchas kohanim, but not eat kachim, that eating truma or performing birchas kohanim does not prove him genealogically fit, otherwise people would feed them their kachim. But the Gemara concludes it is not a proof. Nehemiah permitted them to eat truma because their genealogy was known to be flawed. This permit would not apply to those not known to be flawed.